All right, again, thank you everyone for being here. We are now starting session one, where we will be talking about the structure and separation of powers we find in the Arizona Constitution. I was very excited to lead uh, this panel as a moderator because I've always been uh, interested in the subject of the separation of powers. Um, and to clarify, although it is true that some on our board had some questions about the kind of level of interest in this sort of thing, I really had no such concerns, but then I assume there are lots of nerds out there like me. And as it turns out, clearly I was accurate. Um, so we are not really doing much in the way of introductions of our speakers. They are all very prominent members of the, the legal community, the courts, uh, and academia, and you got extensive CLE materials that took me a long time to prepare that included biographies. So please feel free to refer to those if you have questions. Uh, we will also have fairly brief remarks, I hope, I, we'll see. Um, about eight minutes a piece, eight to 10 minutes a piece on their subjects, and then a little bit of opportunity for follow-up conversation and questions among the group. Um, Federal Society people have heard this quote a lot, but it feels like I can't do the separation of powers panel without quoting Justice Scalia when he said, the genius of the American constitutional system is the dispersal of power. Once power is centralized in one person or one part of government, a bill of rights is just words on paper. And in Arizona, we sort of one-up them. If you look at your handy pocket excerpt constitution that we have out, a few left out front and turn to Article 3, we put the distribution of power, separation of power right in there. No, so we're separated into different departments. Such departments shall be separate and distinct and no one such department shall exercise the powers properly belonging to either of the others. So good on us, Arizona. I will go ahead and introduce our panel. Uh, Andy Kvesek is here to talk with us about the Corporation Commission. I don't know how you're going to do that in eight to 10 minutes, but yeah. <laughs> it should be very interesting and fast. Uh, Tom Basile is going to talk with us about elections, specifically initiatives and referenda and the historical uh, aspect there, of course. Um, my colleague, the Honorable Jim Morse, will be talking to us about the lack of case or controversy requirement. Also much more interesting than it may have seemed up front, or at least the way that he presents it, it should be. And then the Honorable Greg Sakal from the Pima, Pima County Superior Court will be wrapping things up with a uh, discussion of charter cities. Tucson's fairly familiar with that. There was a reason why you... What are, oh, yes. <laughs> what are we up to now, Clint? Is Tucson five? So. Something like that? Anyway, Andy. Is this one on? Can you hear me? Yeah. All right, thanks, Judge Perkins. Um, yeah, I've got 10 minutes, and this is going to be impossible, but thanks for having me on the panel. So quickly, what I'm going to talk about today, I, I just give everyone the benefit of, of, of an explanation of what the commission is, what it does. Um, I'm going to talk about the intent of the founders in creating the commission, because I think that's important to understand when we get into samples of constitutional provisions, why the words are that way and why they're interpreted a certain way. Uh, and then finally, I'm going to touch on the use of originalism and interpreting some of those select um, constitutional passages. So let's talk about the Corporation Commission generally. It is this very, very unique creature of the Arizona Constitution. It's not something that was created by the legislature. It is an independent government agency. It's led by five statewide elected officials. And its primary focus is regulating public utilities. It also does things like regulating the securities marketplace. It's where you go do your business filings. It regulates railroads. But it's, just, it's so unique in the sense that it is, it is not part of the other three branches of government, but within the commission, it exercises executive, judiciary, and legislative powers. Um, it's been said that its legislative powers are, are conducted when it sets rates for public utilities. It exercises judicial powers when it adjudicates grievances. And it exercises executive powers when it adopts rules and regulations regarding utility companies. So, Incredibly unique agency um, because it falls outside of the traditional three branches of government. Now, what the commission is not is it is not the fourth branch of government. Um, and if there's any question about that, you just have to read our keynote speaker's opinion in the Sun City case where he says, it's not the fourth branch of government. <laughs> it's not part of the other three. It was created at the same time as the other three after the third one, but it's not the fourth. It's just a separate branch of government. So 
looking at, at the creation of the commission and the intent behind it, so we have to go back to statehood. It's been around as long as Arizona has been a state. It was created at the Constitutional Convention. Um, what was going on at the time? This was the, the populist era movement where the, the, the view of the world was we need to protect ordinary people against big bad corporations and the elite that have disregarded these, these normal people. There was a very anti-corporate attitude at the time. Um, and as a result, the framers wanted to create a powerful agency that could protect consumers against public service corporations. And so why was the commission the solution? Why not just let the legislature do this? Why not just hand this over to the judiciary to handle? Well, the framers felt that, uh, and, and this is one of the most, most quoted um, comments at the, from the delegation in, in modern day case law. It's because the work of fixing rates is one of the most complicated subjects in the economic world. So it's not something that you can just shove through the legislature because you've got issues of science and engineering and accounting and finance and law and policy and consumer trends and all of these things go into fixing rates. And the framer thought, framers thought that this is just way more than the legislature can handle. We can't expect the judiciary to handle this stuff because it's just going to have, there's going to be so much litigation, they're going to be so jammed up with this, so let's create an independent body that can handle this you know, rate making stuff. Um, and so, so what happens is they, they create the commission to handle this, and the idea was it would be a separate branch to handle these functions and regulate public service corporations. Um, I think it's, it's worth noting the attitudes of the framers at the time, and the minutes from the Constitutional Convention are really enlightening to really understand how, you know, what, why they felt this way. Why did they hate corporations so much? They felt that they were very critical of these, they called wildcat corporations coming to Arizona and they would say these corporations are fleecing the public, they're, they're taking money from the good people of Arizona, they're robbing us, they're making us look like the laughing stock of the world. And, and one of my favorite quotes is, is one delegate said, you know, in, when, when posed with the question of why should the state um, regulate private corporations, this particular delegate said, well, God, didn't, God Almighty didn't create corporations, the state did. So the state should be able to regulate these entities. Um, and another noteworthy comment is, is you know, the first president of the Arizona Senate, Michael Cuniff, said, I don't like to see corporations governing elections. And so when we're talking about the framers, you know, going into the future and then going back, it's, I thought that quote was, you know, worth noting. Um, but at the end of the day, you have what turns into Article 15 of the Arizona Constitution, which <laughs> which creates the Corporation Commission. Um, so it was clear that the framers wanted to create an agency that had really broad power, and they certainly did so. And one example of that is in Article 15, Section 3 of the Arizona Constitution, and that's otherwise known as the Rate Makings Clause. That's the, that gives the commission the power to set the rates. It is said to be the most, the most powerful tool the commission has. And the reason for that is not only does it say the commission shall have power to set the rates, but it says the commission shall set the rates. So it's, it's well settled that this is the exclusive authority of the commission. It's, it's, it's supreme in this regard of setting rates. No one else can do it. But beyond that, the commission has to do it. In other words, they can't delegate that duty to anyone else. And so at the end of the day, no one ever really um, disputes that, that the commission is the one to set the rates in our state. Um, a good example of the analysis of that clause is in the Johnson Utilities opinion, which came out just a couple years ago. And, and the great thing about appellate practice at the commission is you get a new opinion from the Supreme Court like every year, or sometimes two a year. And so I have the distinct pleasure of sitting up here talking about these opinions by the folks that wrote it who are sitting <laughs> right over there. But, but, but I will say in the, in the Johnson case, it's, it's in the materials. It's really a, a beautiful example of the originalist analysis of the Constitution. It talks about the issue in that case was whether the commission had the authority to appoint an interim manager over a public utility. And the court looked at the language in the Constitution and said, you know, that's not really rate making. Uh, that goes beyond that. But the commission may have the power to do it under what's called the permissive clause of um, Article 15, Section 3, which says the commission may uh, do things to, to help the safety and welfare of the patrons of, of uh, public service corporations. And so the court thought, you know, it's not our prerogative to rewrite the Constitution. Um, the Constitution means what it says. And so, yes, 
the commission has the power to appoint an interim manager. Now, interestingly, the dissent in that case, you can take a wild guess who wrote it, um, first points out that the commission is not the fourth branch of government, but <laughs> goes on to argue that, okay, if we're going to be originalists in how we interpret the Constitution, and you're going to take that position, the Constitution also doesn't say that the commission can appoint a manager or take over the management of an entity. So it was a really fascinating debate between the originalists on you know, what the Constitution really means. Um, another section of the, of the Constitution that I wanted to touch on is the commission's power to uh, inspect and investigate records. This is a hot issue because an opinion just came out you know, 10 days ago on whether um, an individual commissioner has the right to subpoena a public service corporation. Um, long story short, a commissioner does, uh, and, and, and the ruling essentially says that the commissioner has that power because the Constitution says so. Um, but again, another great example of the use of looking at the language of the Constitution and saying, when, when the Constitution says that the commission and the several members thereof have the right to inspect and investigate, well, that means the commission as a whole can do it and the individual commissioners can do it. Um, and again, that, the, the ink is still wet uh, on that opinion, so it was really, um, really interesting um, that that just came out. And I had the pleasure of working on all these, these cases, too, so it's really fun to be able to talk about it. But I'll, um, that's about as far as I can go without losing everyone's attention. So, <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you, everyone. First, I just want to say I'm honored to be invited to uh, be on this panel and to talk about a topic that I'm enthusiastic about because it's a big part of uh, my law practice, and it's also an important part of our political system, and that's the initiative and referendum provisions of the state constitution. So I guess I'll start with a quick word on terminology. I think uh, most people are already familiar with these terms, but you know, just to clarify, so an initiative is a law that is written by the citizens and qualifies for the ballot via the petition process. And so initiatives can be in the form of either a statute or an amendment to the state constitution. A referendum, on the other hand, is a public vote, an up or down vote on an act of the legislature. And there's basically two kinds of referenda. One is a referendum that uh, qualifies for the ballot through the petition process. Um, people have, in general, 90 days after the end of the legislative session to get the signatures needed to put a statute on the ballot. Um, second kind of referendum is a referendum initiated by the legislature itself. So under the Constitution, the legislature can send either a statute or a constitutional amendment to the ballot for a thumbs up or thumbs, thumbs down vote by the electorate. So the initiative and referenda were very much a product of the progressive era. I think, you know, as, as Judge uh, Justice Bullock mentioned and as Andy mentioned as well, uh, many provisions of the state constitution were influenced by and, and formed by the um, political climate of the progressive era and the initiative and referendum are certainly an example of this. Um, most of the western states that were admitted in the late 19th, early 20th centuries have mechanisms like this. Um, Arizona's borrowed heavily from Oregon and the Washington constitution. So. When, the, when our Constitutional Convention convened in 1910, it was pretty much a foregone conclusion that the initiative and referendum would be part of the lawmaking power. Apparently, uh, 39 out of the 52 delegates had campaigned on promises to include the initiative, initiative and referendum. And if you read the um, debates of the convention, uh, delegates will frequently note how uh, popular these provisions are and, and the importance of including them in the Constitution. So it wasn't unanimous. There was a small block of delegates, about nine or 10 of them, uh, that were opposed, and they basically, the arguments against the initiative and referenda basically came in two forms. So the first was a concern that it was inconsistent with the Republican government clause of the federal constitution that requires every state to have a Republican form of government. Um, as, as we all know now, the U.S. Supreme Court has basically said those kinds of claims aren't justiciable, but that wasn't known at the time, and so there was a line of thought that this might not be uh, consistent with the federal constitution. Second argument related to the Enabling Act, so because the Enabling Act that set the parameters for statehood didn't mention the initiative and referendum, some delegates were concerned that the lack of an explicit authorization might jeopardize uh, the, the chances of congressional approval of the Constitution. But in the end, the, um, the initiative and referendum provisions made it through the, the uh, language that became the first iteration of Article 4 
Part 1, Section 1, was approved on a 42-9 vote. Interestingly, one of the provisions that actually divided even the proponents of the initiative and referendum was the section that allows the legislature to send statutes to the ballot because the, the line of argument against that was that it was essentially a cop-out for the legislature. So it didn't really serve an accountability mechanism. It was just a way for the legislature to dodge tough questions by sending them to the voters. And at one point in the proceedings, there was a motion that passed to take that provision out. And at some point near the end, it made its way back in, and some delegates actually cried foul because there were concerns about the procedural maneuver to get it back in, but it ended up back in there, and so we do have legislative referrals. So the text itself that was adopted by the convention is, for the most part, pretty straightforward and clear. There are basically no substantive uh, limitations on the initiative power. The Constitution says that if the legislature can enact a bill, the same bill can be enacted via the initiative process. Uh, constitutional amendments have to be limited to a single subject, but statutory measures do not. Uh, they can have as many or as few subjects as the proponents want. Uh, the referendum provision is a little bit naughtier from a textual perspective, and, and Justice Bullock alluded to this. So in general, all statutes passed by the legislature uh, can be referred through the petition process within 90 days of adjournment, but there are basically two exceptions. So there's an exception for laws that are, quote, for the support and maintenance of state institutions and departments. And there's an exception for laws that uh, are immediately necessary for public health, safety, or welfare. And those are denoted by an emergency clause that requires a two-thirds vote in each house. So in 2021, the uh, legislature and the governor enacted a flat tax. It was a tax reform bill that uh, replaced the graduated scale with a flat tax. And the question became, well, is that law referable? And uh, this was a case that my firm uh, was involved in litigating. It's called Arizona Free Enterprise Club versus Hobbs. And we argued, and the, court, the Supreme Court ultimately agreed that this was a support and maintenance measure, and so it was exempt from the referendum. And the court was unanimous insofar as it, it agreed that it was a support and maintenance measure, uh, but there was sort of a divergence after that. The majority concluded that that was enough to render it immune from the referendum. The dissent read the relevant constitutional language as applying that two-thirds majority requirement to at least some support and maintenance measures as well. So as Justice Bullock mentioned, as I completely agree, both opinions are really great exemplars of um, originalist methodology. You know, sometimes originalism gets caricatured as kind of this, you know, magic eight ball or, or you know, decipher, and it's really not, right? It's a, it's a methodology and it's a way of interacting with the text and history. And so I'd encourage everybody to read both the majority and the dissenting opinions in that case because they're really great examples of, um, you know, different, different variants and different strands of originalist methodology. So with the exception of that sort of weird issue in the referendum provision, the text, as I said, for the most part is, is pretty straightforward. Uh, the, the overall parameters of the initiative and referendum power are pretty clear. So, you know, when I was preparing for this presentation, one of the things I found myself wondering is, you know, how did, how did the framers and the framing generation think about how these powers would work in practice, right? So the, the language in the Constitution is pretty clear, but did they, did they expect or envision that these processes would be used, you know, frequently, rarely? What kinds of issues would they be used to decide? So I pulled the publicity pamphlets for the first eight uh, statewide general elections between 1912 and 1920, just to kind of get a sense of how these powers were used in the early days of statehood and how people thought about them. And I found some interesting stuff. So I, I, I had sort of three takeaways from that that I thought I would share with you. So the first, the first takeaway is that the ballot measure process, and this surprised me a little bit, was used much more frequently in those early days of statehood than it is now. So you know, as a as sort of a reference point, there were 63 statewide ballot measures between um, 1912 and 1920, and of those, 53 had qualified um, via the petition process. 100 years later, between 2012 and 2020, there were only 23 statewide ballot measures, and uh, just nine of those had qualified through the petition process. So my guess on that is it's, it's probably largely a function of political economics, right? The, the formulas for signature requirements haven't changed, but you need many more signatures, you know, over 100-fold to get something on the ballot now than you did in 1912. And so it's a very expensive undertaking to get something on the ballot. So I think that's probably doing a lot of the work in, in driving down the frequency of, of how often these processes are used. The second point is, uh, as they are in, in our, you know, our times now, the initiative and referendum were battlegrounds for a lot of hot-button 
social and cultural issues. So, you know, uh, a lot of people probably remember in 2016 and 2020, there were ballot initiatives on marijuana legalization in Arizona. Well, it turns out in 1914, the electorate was voting on similar question only to do with alcohol. And Arizona became one of the first states to write a prohibition amendment into the Constitution. This was a voter-initiated constitutional amendment uh, that passed, I think the margin was about 5347. Uh, voting rights is another hot button issue. Uh, the very first constitutional initiative in Arizona was a measure to expand uh, the right to vote to women. And that passed easily by about a two to one margin. Uh, Vaccine mandates is another sort of controversial issue that we see come up now. Turns out it was, it was controversial back then too. In 1918, there was a statutory initiative that would basically prevent school districts from requiring uh, vaccination as a condition of attendance, although there was an exception for smallpox epidemics. And it passed on a 51-49 vote. Um, and surprisingly, I, I thought this was the most surprising because I wouldn't have guessed that the death penalty was controversial back then, but apparently it was. It was on the ballot three times between 1914 and 1918. There was a, a measure to abolish the death penalty in 1914. It failed by a very, very narrow margin. The proponents brought it back in a little bit of a different form two years later, and it passed. And so there was a two-year interval between 1916 and 1918 when capital punishment was abolished in Arizona. And the proponents of capital punishment then struck back two years later with their own ballot initiative. And that one kind of surprisingly passed easily, uh, I think over 60%. So, you know, and I think, so that, that's sort of another, I guess, parallel to today, right? It's like we see these processes being used to, to you know, uh, as a vehicle to decide hot button issues. And then as now, public opinion seems to be kind of volatile and, and fickle and, and unpredictable. So that seems to be something that hasn't changed. And the third takeaway that I would just mention from that, and I thought this was interesting, is, you know, I think often, you, you certainly hear this in, in the political arena, and we hear this sometimes in, in, um, in litigation as well, in ballot measure litigation, that it seems like sometimes there's a tendency to romanticize sort of the initiative We probably referendum. should have had clocks, but you're over by a couple minutes, so wrap it up. Okay. I'm sorry. It's <laughs> okay. I've seen my time. All right, all right. <laughs> Redistribution. This is a lot of point, I'm sorry. So uh, the point I wanted to make was that, that then as now there was a debate even then about what the, what the proper nature and function of the initiative and referendum was. Um, the original text of the Constitution allowed the legislature to amend voter-initiated in statutes. In 1914, there was a measure uh, to basically prevent legislative amendments of measures that receive the vote of a majority of the, the entire electorate, not just the voters. And it passed just barely by I think the margin was 83 votes statewide. Um, and so the takeaway there is, you know, uh, I think there's a debate that started in 1910 and it still is going on now about how to appropriately balance these direct democracy uh, mechanisms with um, government by elected representatives. Hello everyone, my name is Jim. Um, I am honored to be here today and I want to uh, start off with a quick show of hands. Who agrees with the title of this presentation, which I think is supposed to be the lack of a case or controversy. Who agrees Arizona lacks a case or controversy requirement in our Constitution? Show of hands. Raise them up. All right. You and the Supreme Court of our state are all wrong. <laughs> um, the Supreme Court has said since 1982 a whole bunch of times, I looked it up but now I've forgotten the number, that there is no case or controversy requirement. It's baloney. Um, starting in 1912, the Arizona Constitution uh, has Article 6, Section 6, which is now Section 14 in the amended Constitution, it says, the Superior Court shall have original jurisdiction in all cases. So there's a case requirement. People distinguish that from our, the limitation on power in the federal Constitution, which says it shall only extend. That's not what the federal Constitution says. Judicial power shall extend to all cases. So both constitutions have a case requirement. Um, the controversy part of the federal constitution comes later and it says it also extends to controversies between two or more states, etc. So just as a matter of text, I think it's baloney. But I think there's a better reason to think that the, there is a case or controversy requirement. And contrary to Justice Bullock's admonition earlier, I believe it's coterminous are exactly identical to the federal case or controversy requirement, at least as the federal case or controversy requirement was understood at the time. 
Why? Well, let's dive into it. Article 6 passed. It has this case or, case or proceedings. There's other language in the Constitution. I'm not going to read it, but it's in the materials that I gave you that says cases and proceedings can be heard. Okay. I tried to look to see if there was any discussion of this at the Constitutional Convention. Couldn't find any. My research skills may be lacking, but you're feel free to look for yourself. This was not a controversial provision. It was borrowed from Washington's constitutional provision, and I spent way too much time trying to look up Washington cases for a while. And then I woke up one night and said, why do I care what Washington said? Because in 1972, we reenacted the modern judiciary provision, and now we have Article 6, Section 14, which adopts cases and proceedings. So we should be caring about what was understood in Arizona from 1912 to 1972 when our new constitutional provision was amended. That makes logical sense. So I look back at our cases and quit worrying about out-of-state cases. In 1919, our Arizona Supreme Court decided a case called McCall v. City of Tucson. And it involved a challenge, or City of Tombstone, Tombstone, not Tucson. Uh, no charter issue. They had a vote in that county <laughs> to uh, decide whether or not to uh, relocate the county seat. It was like, very close, like 80 votes separated the two. This guy named McCall says, I want to keep it here, or I want to move it from Tombstone, or keep it in Tombstone, whatever. Who cares? Um, <laughs> and filed suit in Superior Court. And the US, Arizona Supreme Court said, this is not a case or proceeding, because there's no authorization in statute for a challenge to a county seat election. The statute authorizes challenges to, um, to elections for officers, uh, referendums, all sorts of things, but doesn't have any authorization for county seat challenges. So there is no case authorized under the law. So not really definitive, except that it tells you that very early on our Supreme Court took a very look at, there's no prudential standing, this is a jurisdictional issue. It didn't matter that this was, no one else could review this, that there was a close dispute, it didn't matter any of those things. There's no jurisdiction, they kicked the case out. But not a lot of analysis as to how that fit in. But we'll flash forward 12 more years, 1931. Who here knows who Winnie Ruth Judd was? Okay, if you're old like me, into your 50s, you, were, you know who that was. It was. She was the trunk murderess, and it was like a big case. And so the, she killed her husband and chopped him up and put him in a trunk. And they went and filed a uh, criminal complaint against her in justice court, as they did back in those days, to hold her uh, pending transfer of that case to the Superior Court. And they also seized her home for evidentiary purposes, kind of like put that tape around it and wouldn't let anyone have access to her home. Well, her defense attorneys rushed to Superior Court and filed a writ of prohibition or one of those old fashioned -y things that we used to file back in the days <laughs> and said, we want access to her home so we can examine the evidence too. And the Superior Court granted it. And the county attorney appealed and said, there's no jurisdiction because there is no case pending before the Superior Court. There's a justice court case, but there is no Superior Court case. And the, Superior Court, and the Supreme Court agreed, said there is no case that over which the Superior Court has jurisdiction. All right, but it went a little further, and Justice, uh, I thought it was Lorna Lockwood for the longest time, because it shows you how bad my Arizona history is, is the other Lockwood Justice, Alfred Lockwood, uh, wrote this decision and said, hey, we have a case or proceeding, and goes into some extensive analysis, maybe not as much as Justice Bullock would like, but it's not just a passing reference, to why case or proceeding under the Arizona Constitution means exactly the same thing as case or controversy under the federal Constitution. Cites a whole bunch of federal authorities, and I'll read you one quick part of it. He says, after explaining that controversy just is another word for a civil case in federal uh, nomenclature, and cases are cases that are authorized to be brought, citing Marbury versus Madison and another uh, decision by Justice uh, Frankfurter, he says, we agree with this definition of case, and we think and reason the term proceeding under our Constitution must possess the same qualities. They kicked it out. No jurisdiction. After that, that was the law in Arizona for a long time. 1941, again, citing to federal authorities, uh, State v. Hall, also authored by Justice A. Lockwood, um, 
Cases and proceedings referred to therein are only matters by law which are triable before some court. A disputed matter therefore does not become a case or controversy, a case or proceeding until the law provides for hearing before a court and cites the federal authorities to it, for it too. 1941, 1960, uh, State v. Hammond, State X. R. Hammond versus King Justice Precinct, citing those older authorities, those Arizona authorities for the jurisdictional analysis. Campbell v. Thurman, it is only after jurisdiction is conferred by the Constitution, statute or rule, and when a case or controversy is pending before the court that inherent, any inherent common law powers may be used. Arizona Supreme Court again, 1967, another Arizona Supreme Court case, citing back to Andrews, the, the, the Winnie Ruth Judd case. It was established, well established, in Arizona courts by our Supreme Court that case or proceeding meant case or controversy all the way through 1971, citing Andrews again for the same proposition by our Arizona Court of Appeals. So what do we do with that? In 1972, when Arizona reenacted Article 6, now Section 14, we presume that the decision interpreting that language by the highest court in the state, we presume the voters must have understood that that's what case or proceeding meant, case or controversy. It's the prior construction canon, everyone cites to Scalia v. Garner, but it's not just Scalia and Garner. In 1924, our Arizona Supreme Court applied the prior construction canon to interpret Arizona's law that had been copied from Texas law. And what we said in that case was, Texas courts have interpreted it this way. When we enacted that law, we knew of the Texas court's interpretation, our legislature presumably knew of the Texas court's interpretation, so we have to apply the same interpretation here. Silver v. Pueblo del Sol Water Company, 2018, our Supreme Court and in May Marriage of Freedmen and Rolls adopted the same rule. The prior construction canon means when we enacted Article 6, Section 14, I know I'm speaking quickly because we've got limited time. I feel like I've got a lot to say. Um, <laughs> the prior construction canon means in 1972, our voters enacted case or proceeding knowing that it meant case or controversy. So what happens? 1972 post Arizona courts, both the Court of Appeals and the uh, Supreme Court, continue to cite Andrew. There's not a lot of analysis for it. But then 1982 rolls around. And is anybody close friends or relative of Justice Gordon? I come not to praise him, but to bury him because he just made it up. <laughs> January 7th, 1982, Justice Gordon, in a case in which no one had raised standing, throws this throwaway line in there. Fraternal Order of Police Lodge versus Phoenix Employee Relation Board, January 7, 1982. Unlike the federal court system, the powers, which are, powers of which are limited by Article 3, Section 2 of the Constitution, our state court system has no constitutional provision constraining it to consider only cases or controversies. Well, it, cases, for sure, but he says there's nothing in there. But it's not an issue there, there's no analysis, but he just throws that line away. Six months later, him writing again, cites to that case from six months before, <laughs> and says, we have serious doubts as to whether appellants have standing to raise this argu argument. Standing, however, is a part of the case or controversy doctrine of the US Constitution. Blah, 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 because of this clause, the federal courts constitution, constitutionally have jurisdiction only over cases or controversies, which occur only when the parties have standing. Arizona has no analog to the case or controversy provision in its constitution. So now it's not only there, do we not have a case or controversy, we don't even have an analog to it, which I don't know how you could describe case and proceeding as something less than an analog to case or controversy, but he does. Um, analog to the case or controversy provision in its constitution and our reluctance to consider issues raised where there is no standing is solely a rule of judicial restraint. And since then, every year and a half, our Supreme Court and me, I said this in a mem decision not too long ago, <laughs> says there is no case or controversy requirement in the Arizona constitution. That's it. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Uh, I, I will add one more thing. 
now that I've gotten all fired up, I don't know that it matters. Okay, if you look at the cases in which the Arizona Supreme Court has exercised um, jurisdiction prudentially, as opposed to constitutionally, it's pretty much mirrors the same analysis that the federal courts use on determining when they're going to find a, the lack of standing to be excusable and still consider the case. So I think we're wrong, but I don't know that it matters. And with that, I will now cede the rest of my time. You have no time to cede, but <laughs> we appreciate the gesture. Well, Jennifer, thank you for letting the trial judge go after the appellate judge. It's a very <laughs> unusual circumstance for us. As, as was noted in recent years, the Supreme Court has had two cases, both involving the city of Tucson, in which it's been called upon to apply Article 13, Section 2's Home Rule Charter provision. Uh, Tucson 5 is in your materials if uh, this presentation lags. Uh, the constitutional provision grants any city with a population of more than 3,500 inhabitants the ability to frame a charter of its own government, and here's the key words, consistent with and subject to the constitution and laws of the state. The remainder of the provisions are in your materials on page 140. When determining whether a home rule city may adopt provisions that are contrary to state law, a majority of the court has followed a test that focuses primarily on whether the subject matter is characterized as either statewide or purely local interest. The court has admitted that this case law is muddled, the test is problematic, and it lacks any self-evident definitions. However, the court has continued to follow this test and it's rejected other approaches, including California's approach and also proprietary approach. To date, the court has found only two policy areas that are matters of purely local concern. The administration of city elections, the city of Tucson thanks you, and the sale of city-owned real estate. On the other hand, our keynote speaker has argued that the majority's test is a judicially manufactured line of constitutional demarcation between matters of statewide and purely local concern. He says it blurs the constitutional provision with the implementing statute, which is ARS 9-284. And he says the case law should be overruled. Of note, he's raised these arguments without any party raising them to him. So he's, for those practitioners in the room, he wishes someone to raise this argument <laughs> in the future. As a matter of state constitutional law, Justice Bollock argues that a, state, a constitutional state statute on any topic will always invalidate a home rule city's conflicting ordinance. However, if the statute does not occupy the field, does not conflict with the charter provision, then the city's provision stands. The justices, as noted in your materials, have sparred over the language of Article 13. I was doing research saying, how could I possibly add to this conversation? And I thought it would be helpful to look at the history that led up to the adoption of it. Uh, turning the clock back to 1910, uh, Arizona's population had doubled in the last decade to just over 200,000 people. We only had seven towns or cities with more than 5,000 inhabitants. I'll, I'll say at that moment in time, Tucson was larger than the city of Phoenix. Uh, cities were powerless, absent action by the Legislative Assembly, that allowed them to act. There was no inherent right of local self-government. Much of the territorial legislation regarding towns and cities was done by special laws. Cities were formed by special laws. The territorial assembly also took great interest in allowing Prescott, for example, to establish some alleyways. Authorizing Tucson, oh yeah, Tucson gave some grants of land to the railroads, but they didn't have authorization to do it. So the legislative assembly post hoc had to fix that problem. And lastly, City of Phoenix wanted to establish a county hospital. So they had to go to the legislature and get a special act of the legislature. We know when the framers of the Arizona Constitution met in the late 1910, they debated a provision regarding municipal corporations. From the records of the convention, we know they knew what was going on in other states. There was specific reference to Missouri, Oklahoma, and California. There was also a mention of a desire for cities to be able to govern themselves without the need to seek legislative permission for every act they needed to take. One member of the convention from Bisbee said, we have a problem with water runoff. It actually rained in Bisbee at the time. And they said, we need to deal with this. We shouldn't have to go up to the legislature and get permission to deal with that issue. Ultimately, the convention borrowed the Home Rule Charter provision taken up in Oklahoma in 1907. It also addressed the potential abuse of special legislation 
directed to municipalities by adopting not one, but two separate pr prohibitions on the same in our Constitution. One issue that hasn't been fully addressed, again, is what was going on in those other states. What did the people at the convention know what was going on? First of all, uh, in other states, state legislatures, especially on the East Coast, were descending into regulation of the minutest detail of municipal government. And most of it was done by special legislation. So people in those states said, there's a problem. We need to get the legislature out of local city affairs because we saw it ripe for corruption and abuse by special interests. So other states were beginning to enact legislation or constitutional provisions to stop special laws directed towards municipalities, but also to adopt home rule charter provisions. This is where the history is relevant to our current debate amongst the court. Missouri was the first state to adopt a home rule charter in 1875. Uh, the city of St. Louis wanted to be able to govern themselves as the largest city in that state. But there was a concern that Missouri, that St. Louis might become its own independent city state. Think back to your ancient history. They would exist within, Saint, they would exist within Missouri, but they could make their own rules. So at this constitutional convention, there was a compromise. And the compromise said that St. Louis could form its own government, but it had to be consistent with and subject to the constitutions and laws of the state, and also in harmony with that. That clear language, according to Justice Bullock, uh, was litigated in the Missouri state courts for years to come. Initially, the Missouri courts agreed with our keynote speaker and said that general laws made by the legislature controlled over all local ordinances when there was a conflict. It was 1884 in Missouri. Cases continued to percolate through that court over the next six years. And by 1990, the, the Missouri Supreme Court totally reversed course. They took approach that said that same language in its constitution now meant that the state could not legislate on matters of local or municipal concern, even by general law. Cases continued to percolate to that court. By 1904, the court admitted that its decisions in this area were mazes of adjudication and there was a labyrinth of ingenious and divergent reasons behind all the decisions. But remember, that is the language adopted by our framers. Uh, other states, despite what was happening in Missouri, continued to adopt the same approach. California adopted similar language in 1879. That language went to the California Supreme Court. And like Missouri, initially, they said, this is clear. General laws prevail over conflicting charter provisions. This is where the right of the voters stepped in. Uh, in California, the California voters did not like the Supreme Court decision, and they moved to modify their state constitution, and they provided in 1896 that home rule cities were subject to general laws, except, new language, except in municipal affairs. So clearly the voters there adopted more clear language that would allow cities to control their local affairs. Another approach of which our founders were aware was the Minnesota approach in 1896. Minnesota stole, borrowed, whatever term you wanted to do, the Missouri language. But in addition to that, they wanted to be clear. They said that uh, any charter amendments had to be in harmony with state law and state constitution. And they also said if there's ever a conflict between state law and the city charter, the general laws would be paramount. The result of that clear language, maybe more clear than Arizona's language, is that the Minnesota courts never went down this path that we have in Missouri and Arizona. As noted, in 1907, Oklahoma adopted its charter provisions. It also adopted an implementing statute, which our framers borrowed, as noted, uh, in Tucson 5 in 1912. In 1911, one year before we became a state, Oklahoma's judiciary adopted the Missouri approach and said that home rule charters prevail on purely local or municipal concerns. I recognize we're here on a Friday afternoon attentions may be short. So what are my key, key takeaways for you? First of all, Arizona's home rule charter and anti-special law provisions were consistent with the larger political movements regarding municipalities. Arizona's framers intended for home rule charter cities to be able to address local issues as necessary without having to seek legislative permission. This was a change from our territorial experience. There's no record of any discussion during the convention of how conflicts between the two would be resolved and the framers had options before it of differing language. They could have followed the California approach and clearly put charter cities priority on local concerns. They didn't do that. They could have taken the Minnesota approach and prioritized general laws. They did not do that. 
Rather, they picked Missouri law, which they knew had very conflicting ju judicial determinations. Uh, at the end of the day, in the right case brought before the court, I think both states need to look at the history behind these laws uh, in other states, look how they were interpreted, because that's what we borrowed. And at the end of the day, if you find there's still a muddle of the constitutional interpretation, it's not my fault, it's not the Supreme Court's fault, it's all Missouri's fault. So. <laughs> All right. We may find other things to blame other states for throughout the day. Let's, let's look for that. Um, I, I wanted to first give the panelists, you have very disparate topics here um, individually, but I wanted to give you a chance if any of you had any follow-up thoughts or questions for each other uh, at the outset here. Okay. You should have just let me ramble, I would have. I should have, I should have. <laughs> that might have been more interesting. You ask yourself a question. <laughs> yeah, you could. You could ask yourself a question, I guess. But I will instead start, Andy. Uh, you mentioned in the Burns v. APS that, um, you know, it clearly applies to investigations of public service corporations. Um, was there any language hinting, does this apply more broadly to all publicly traded companies, or do you think the, the court cabined itself? Well, I can tell you that this is a debate that's happening in real time in the real world. And while the Burns v. APS decision does say it was presented with the narrow issue of, of whether uh, a commissioner could subpoena a public service corporation, I think if you look at the plain language of the Constitution, which, which says the, uh, that a commissioner can also issue a subpoena to any corporation whose stock shall be offered for sale to the public, you look at the plain language of the Constitution, you look at the intent of the drafters, I think that answer is absolutely. Um, so I look forward to seeing how Danny Seiden and the AZ Chamber amend the Arizona Constitution. Um, no comment on that. Uh, Tom, as you, you, you may be familiar that litigation in your area is not uncommon. Um, yeah, so as I've heard, yeah. <laughs> And you noted the Free Enterprise Club. The court has had occasion recently to, to opine on the meaning of, of the original provisions. Um, we, we have some add-on language. The Voter Protection Act mm -hmm. is, is something that has come, certainly came about in a certain context. I guess I wanted to just see if you had any additional thoughts, uh, having now looked at the original history of mm -hmm. the original provisions and then thinking about the Voter Protection yeah, Act. Yeah, so for background, the Voter Protection Act is the name of a, a voter-initiated constitutional amendment that passed, I believe, in, in the late 1990s. And it basically makes it essentially impossible for the legislature to change any statute that voters have um, enacted via the initiative or referendum. You, you need th uh, three-quarters vote in each house, and it has to further the purpose of the uh, voter-initiated measure. So it basically closes off any possibility of, of legislative amendments. And it's, it, it touches on this, this broader um, historical trend that as this constitutional provision has evolved, there's been this, I think, ongoing debate about, well, you know, how do you balance? Because obviously, you know, on the one end of the spectrum, if you give the legislature carte blanche to just make any and all changes to every initiative, it, it, it kind of ends up subsuming the initiative power. But on the other hand, you know, if you, if you end up with something like the VPA, you end up giving what were really just statutes almost something close to quasi-constitutional status because it's all but impossible to change them. And so, you know, I, the, the first time this issue came up was in 1914, and uh, it was a provision that said um, that if an initiative receives the vote of the majority of the entire electorate, not just people voting on the measure, but the entire electorate, it basically can't be changed. And um, this was the, the measure I referred to briefly at the end of my opening remarks, and this j just barely, barely passed, like 50.1%. Like um, and then a couple of years later, the legislature referred to the ballot sort of a countermeasure in 1916 that said uh, no initiative or referendum can become law um, unless it receives an outright majority of people voting at that election. Uh, not just people who are actually ticking a yes or no box, but you know, the denominator is everybody who turned out for that election. And that one just barely failed. Um, and so you know, I, think, I think the VPA is sort of the latest in this push-pull that we've seen uh, over the last 100 years about how do you, how do you strike that balance between you know, government by an elected legislature and these direct democracy mechanisms. I'll be honest, Jim, I had a, a little bit of difficulty coming up with a follow-up question um, after that presentation. I think, frankly, we'd tell all... Honest, tell me a lie. 
We'd all like to know if there's anything else that the Arizona Supreme Court has said that you think is baloney. <laughs> you have a microphone. That'll take the rest of our time. That's true. I will exercise my Fifth Amendment rights. <laughs> Well, you, you indicated that, that you don't think it matters. Um, and maybe you have some follow-up thoughts on that. I'll leave it there. I, I wanted to find a case that I could uh, point to and say if, if, um, the ex if, the, if the Supreme Court had realized that it has a constitutional limitation as opposed to a prudential limitation on its authority to hear a case that the result would come out differently. I couldn't find one. Um, that's why I'm not sure how much it matters. I, and I, I believe me, I did not look at every case in which standing has been raised as an issue. But I looked at some of the big ones in the last couple of years and uh, couldn't find one, at least under the federal constitution. Now, Justice Bullock's comments earlier made me think, maybe we shouldn't be considering any kind of expansion of prudential, quasi-prudential jurisdiction from the Supreme Court, US Supreme Court after 1972, that we should be locked in on what was considered standing at that time, um, but I haven't thought about that. Okay. Did I did I capture your your thoughts properly? Uh, possibly. Possibly. <laughs> <laughs> Greg, do you think that there are any other issues that would be found to be matters of local, purely local concern, based on the jurisprudence to date? I think it would be very difficult. I was looking over the issues and topics that have been discussed, and I think if we're under the current test of local versus statewide concern, so much as uh, statewide concern at least touches upon statewide concern, including the police power, I think it would be very difficult for municipalities to deal with it otherwise. All right. Well, we're actually done a little bit early because everybody's stuck very close-ish to their time frames. Um, I suspect the next panel we has a lot more questions from the audience? well I promised our panelists we wouldn't take questions oh. from the audience but if you want to if it looks like Judge Morse would like to hear your no, questions. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> sorry ask him at the break um, so I'm gonna cede some of our panel time to the next panel which I suspect some of the panel members may have more questions or responses to each other uh, on those topics so something to look forward to. We will take another about a 15 minute break. Um, Professor Dysart will be moderating the next panel and she will call you back in when we're ready. This is the rights and federal cognates. We'll get to hear um, about such light topics as the right to bear arms and free speech. So little, little things. All right, thanks.